Good morning. Thank you for coming to the 8th Annual Jumping the Desk. If you're new here or this is your first conference, welcome. This is a great day that we come together, engage with new and different ideas, and get to do some reflections on ourselves as teachers, learners, and, support, and uh, student supporters. So um, I just wanted to clarify about jumping the desk. There is no physical, actual jumping of desks happening today. Um, I brought it up as a possible event. I was told it's a terrible, terrible idea. Um, it's just a metaphor, and it's very, very unsafe. Okay, so please don't do that. So, the, bear with me, guys. It's going to be bad. So, the CTL Planning Board has worked very hard to put on an excellent conference for you guys. I'd like to thank all the folks across campus who have come together to put this uh, event on today. Um, if I could do that individually, I would, but I'd be up here all the morning, so we're not going to do that. But my bet is that you already know who these fine people are and they do an excellent job. So can we actually give a round of applause for everybody who helped put this together today? Thank you. So the conference theme is innovation and design and how we support student success. This year is particularly special. We actually have two experts from Universal Design for Learning um, that are here today. Uh, our speaker, Michael Nesmith, who you'll hear from in a bit, and Dr. Manju Banerjee from Landmark College. Both are going to help us dive in deeper on UDL and continue the conversation from earlier this week and share some great takeaways as many of us, including myself, launch into the weekend getting ready to write our syllabi and course outlines. You guys have done that already? Yeah. yeah. Oh, geez, I'm behind. Okay, shocker. So uh, before we get there, a few pieces of housekeeping. Uh, please note the closest exit to you in case of like a snow day or a fire or something like that. Um, we have a hashtag on Twitter, it's hashtag jumping the desk. If you want to jump in on the conversation, uh, share some ideas, pictures, whatever. Um, it's kind of nice for the people who can't be here to kind of look in on the day. It's also a great like reference point for later. I'm going to incentivize it further with uh, picking a random tweet from the day as one of the raffle winners. So right now I think it's just me and Trevor on there, so the odds are pretty good if you want to jump in. So. Please refer to your schedules. They're at the table outside. I see a lot of green and blue folders in your hands. You have the right stuff um, for locations and times. After this talk, we're going to be walking across the second floor to 2775, the large lecture halls, for Dr. Manju's um, uh, talk on understanding learning differences. If you are lost or you have questions or concerns, just look out for the CTL staff. We will be the people who look like we know what we're doing. So, that's a tough crowd, okay. So, <laughs> we hope to see you all at the reception at 3 p.m. in the cafe for some wine and snacks. The raffle will be drawn there and the winners will receive some wine from the president's uh, collection. Thank you, Dr. Rob Nye. So, make sure to fill out your session and conference evaluations and bring them to the reception at the end of the day. That's how you'll get your ticket and uh, we have six bottles of wine to raffle off, so that's pretty great. All right, so thanks for bearing with me. This morning, a very special treat a universal design expert hailing from both higher ed and the high tech worlds. He's come in all the way from Seattle, Washington to speak with us today. We're very excited to have him here. Would you please join me in giving a warm Finger Lakes welcome to Michael Allen Nesmith. for an interpreter with a voice similar to Morgan Freeman. <laughs> and just that excellent fluid voice, but apparently they're in popular demand and couldn't get one right now. <laughs> but that's okay. Even if my uh, interpreter doesn't have Morgan Freeman voice, I'd like to thank Mason and Virginia for working with us today. As Sean has already mentioned, my name is Michael Nesmith. And my name sign is the M handshake here at the chest. Just a little bit about me before I dive in today. I'm an art director at Amazon for their in-house marketing team. I 
I work on the All Fire TV product. So if you see advertisements out there, that is what my team works on. All my designs works are customer facing, which means that what I am working on is what the customer sees. I am a native Chicagoan from the Midwest, so uh, the drive here, I was uh, pretty familiar with the conditions. I saw, you know, cars that had slid off the road and uh, kind of felt like I was at home. You know, kind of from Seattle, it's a little bit different. I'm also a uh, Lego master, pretty involved with the Lego community. I uh, help give advice to different people who are trying to create or build different items. I also really enjoy participating in jujitsu. Right now I am a pro belt, uh, if that's something that you find interesting and cool. If you may have noticed, I also happen to be completely deaf. I grew up deaf, I've been deaf my entire life. I was born to deaf parents, my brother and sister are deaf. Now some people, or sometimes people do not realize that there are two different kinds of deaf people in the world, two different divisions. One consider themselves medically deaf. And really that group is full of a diverse population latent deaf, so think of senior citizens as one example, or some deaf people who have a slight hearing loss or mild hearing loss, and they really try and go the oral route, really focus on getting uh, hearing assistive technologies, hearing aids, cochlear implants, and focus on oral training. The other group are considered culturally deaf. And what that means is that they have their own language, like what I'm using today. It's part of their identity. They have their own community, their own traditions, their own habits. The members of that group typically go to all deaf schools, deaf colleges, um, education systems, where the classrooms are uh, predominantly signed, where the instructors and the other staff members all know sign and communicate in such a way. Now, personally, I identify and belong with the culturally deaf group. Now, that's how I consider my perspective in the world. That's the lens that I see. I don't see my deafness as a disability. I feel that I have our own systems, our own language. Everything is right there. It's a cultural identity. Now, when I remove myself and look at a different perspective, that's really when I feel more aware of um, the difference between myself and the other parts of the population. Um, I am really passionate about accessibility, universal design, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but today I have one story that I would really like to share with you all. Now it happened first day during my grad school program. Um, it will make you all a little cringy. <laughs> okay, now imagine your first day in grad school at New Art School. Now it's an all hearing school. I was the only deaf individual there. I haven't met any of my cohort haven't met my graduate advisor. Now that graduate advisor would be my mentor through the three-year program. I haven't met the interpreters as well. Now that interpreter who was assigned to work with me, um, you know, I, I show up for the first day of class a little bit early, just trying to uh, get a better sense of the layout. I meet the interpreter and try to get a acquainted, you know, with each other. I felt a little bit vulnerable in this space because it really was a first date and it was uh, kind of an understatement to say that I was feeling that way. Um, now try to imagine, I'm going to paint a little bit of a picture for you to try and, you know, get a sense of what I was dealing with. Now, 
My interpreter had big hair, lacquered makeup, large fingernails, and um, she was just painted. And she was very visually loud, just a lot going on there. And it really made it really tough for me to focus on the content that was being delivered. It made things even worse because her signing wasn't great. I, I wish that she was uh, a little bit more uh, skilled, but uh, in that moment, I just kind of had to deal with what I had and just uh, continue on with this interpreter at that moment. Um, now, the graduate teacher was okay. Everything was going on fine. Me and the new cohort doing the introductions. And as we were progressing through the class, we were getting close to the end, and we were discussing the uh, next morning session, what was going to be happening. And I offered to bring some donuts to the early morning session. Now, you know, donuts are pretty nice. Everyone would like the person that brings donuts, right? I mean, that, that sounds like that's a good thing. Everyone loves the guy who brings donuts to the meeting, right? But something odd happened. My cohort kind of got these weird faces, kind of started looking around after I made my comment, and uh, I thought that that was kind of a strange response, like they, they don't like donuts, and I realized there was a misinterpretation. The professor kind of gave me a weird expression too, and just responded with, okay, and I looked at the interpreter, and I felt that there was a misinterpretation that happened. And I'm really not good at lip reading, but I could catch a little bit. And the interpreter had actually voiced, I would like to have a private discussion with you after class. And I hadn't said that yet, so I was thrown off. It had nothing to do with the donuts. <laughs> so, you know, I was just red-faced at that moment, just caught off guard, and I had no control in that situation. No, it, she was my voice, and she had got my message wrong. And now there was this huge misunderstanding, and everyone was thinking that I was this really awkward, weird fellow that, you know, first day of class just asked for a private, important meeting with the professor in front of everybody. And to date, that is the most embarrassing situation. It takes the cake for the worst misinterpretation. And really, that story is how I fired my first interpreter. <laughs> and through that experience, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, through that experience, I learned the power of advocacy. You know, in order to get the appropriate accommodation that I needed, you know, I, I really learned that during that situation. I realized that no one else except myself knows exactly what I need. If I didn't fight for what I need, then my future was just going to be lousy. <laughs> uh, there would be distractions, there would be misinterpretations, and I just had to take control of that. It took me several months of weeding through different interpreters until I found the team that worked for me. And those two interpreters followed me throughout my grad program. We developed a really great rapport. Um, they understood the program-specific terminology, and really, uh, they just they were there for the entire program. And I was able to advocate with the interpreters, and they were also able to take on the role as advocates for myself as far as, you know, working with me for meetings, um, if there were any comments with, uh, you know, direct terminology, I was able to let them know that they were being sarcastic, um, you know, it was just really a new environment, um, it was just completely different with those two. And now going forward, I'm able to bring notes to the class meeting without uh, you know, being awkward. It really just improved my grad experience going forward. Now we're going to shift directions. I just would like to talk a little bit about uh, what I want you all to take away from this presentation. You know, kind of keep in the back of your minds while you prepare for your classes.
My goal today is to encourage you to think innovatively, have empathy with the approach for accessibility of your students. We often assume that the resources um, are there for other people, but they're also there for ourselves. Um, do we have anyone here? Um, you know, thankfully we have the interpreters here for accessibility. Um, but really, the interpreters are an accommodation, yes, but they are a bridge between me and you, the audience. They're here for you to understand me as much as they're here for me to understand you. It's for that equal access, that equality level footing. It's for that perspective, it really depends. There is um, just a thought that disability is nothing more than perspective. For example, my wife, uh, she's hearing and she feels disabled when she's in a room that's full of uh, my deaf college friends. You know, we're all just signing, with each other talking, but when she's brought into that environment, she just feels lost and she's just, you know, wow, I'm disabled. You know, she can talk, yes, but that's that difference in perspective. Now, we have accents in ASL as well, different regional signs, slang, um, you know, just in case you were wondering, those are things to keep thought of. Um, accessibility, accommodation, universal design show up and they are there to empower people. And I would like you all to leave here today with the inspiration to think differently about how you are able to use tools to benefit everyone and not just someone else, but everyone. I'd like you to leave here with the idea to think of little tweaks that you can make to your classroom to make it more accessible. So what is universal design, uh, abbreviation UD? What is that anyway? Now, Ron Mace, a late professor at the Center of Universal Design at North Carolina State University, he said that universal design is the design of products and environment to be universally understood amongst all people to the greatest extent possible. Without the need for adaptation or specialized design, one design for everybody. All objects that we use and interact with fall onto a spectrum for universal design. For example, a doorknob. You see that guy? Obviously, he can't use a doorknob. We can, but he can't. Also, it's not accessible to people with arthritis, uh, people who have limited mobility with their hands. They can't twist the doorknob. But it is on the spectrum of universal design. Think about children who are small. They're not able to reach the doorknob. They can't twist it. How can this be improved? How can we improve this design? Well, we move to the door lever. Now, the guy here on the left is able to use it. Use his hook to pull the lever down. It is a better design, but it's a perfect no, but it is an improvement. And now there, there's still a problem because it does ignore people in the wheelchairs. Imagine people in wheelchairs trying to get into a room with that door lever. They get there, they're not able to move their wheelchair back. I mean, it's not in the picture right here. We have a mother with a phone in her hand and a stroller. Now, she doesn't look disabled, but in this situation with the door lever, it does make her disabled. Mm -hmm. 
And this can still be tweaked a little bit better to be almost perfect. The sliding door, it doesn't involve any interaction whatsoever. You're able to just walk straight through a wheelchair, uh, the pirate with the hook, the mother with the stroller. It works fine. Even animals can use it. <laughs> you know, imagine that. And that is what universal design is. But I'd like to go back just a little bit. Now, it speaks about products. Now, that doorknob is a product, but the environment is where you dive in because the environment is what the classroom really is. Now, before we dive into the solution for the environmental universal design, I would like to just point out some common problems here. I look back at my experience as a student, and I see just so many opportunities for improvements to accessibility. I have a wide range of experience with accessibility going to school for the deaf, where ASL was the only language spoken. All students and teachers used ASL. And then I had a switch, and I was a member of a eight-child cohort in a mainstream program. We had eight children who would go into a hearing student environment, and that's called mainstreaming. And then switched to a different educational system where I was the only deaf student in an art school. So I really had a taste of each of these different environments, a wide spectrum. I'm able to see the variations in different accessibility barriers that they all had. Now through those environments, um, they have any ASL control room. I was dependent on an interpreter just all the time. And that was something that just drove me insane in these hearing programs. The teachers would just rattle on and just keep talking, just keep going. You know, they would just get carried on a topic and there would be no break. Or they wouldn't stop to allow me to process and take notes. Think about me as a deaf individual. I have to look at the interpreter and then when I look down to take notes, they're still going. The instructor and the interpreter are still going. Then when I look up, I'm lost. And that was one of the biggest frustrations I had. Also, you have lag time with the interpreters. Sometimes the teachers would make a joke, the classroom would laugh, and they would die down. And 15 seconds later, I let out a little giggle and everyone just kind of <laughs> looks at me. You know, I mean, it's a little bit awkward. <laughs> And imagine the other art students, you know, we had similar experiences. Maybe someone with ADD uh, or other different kinds of disability. Autism, dyslexia. We all are trying to get in on the joke and catch that punchline, but we're a little bit slower and it's a little bit frustrating. <clears throat> I also learned uh, simple facts of where I sit in the classroom really makes a huge difference on my education. If I sat right in front of the interpreter, or just right across from each other, close, my stream of information with the environment, with the teacher, the screen becomes very narrow. Imagine if I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the interpreters. Who's talking? I have no idea where that voice is coming from. I just see the interpreter. I have to crane my neck to look at the screen, but the interpreter is still going, and I have to look back, and I try to catch up with what is being discussed, or I have to look around the room. It is just, it's a lot. So I tried to tweak that by making a small change and showing up five minutes earlier. And as soon as I got there, I would take this seat here in the lower 
left hand corner then I have the interpreter sit in the opposite corner. That way they are positioned where I can see the screen and the instructor and it increases my field of view. So now the interpreters are able to switch on and off as well. You know, they, they take about 30 minute breaks and um, then the processing starts to break down. They switch to the other interpreter. So while the one interpreter is uh, in the hot seat signing, interpreting for the voices, um, then the other interpreter is still providing support to the other one like what we have now. But my visual track is better. Teacher will be standing, pointing to what's on the screen or even on the board. I'm able to track with the instructor. If students are adding commentary, I'm able to grab who's talking by seeing them. But the interpreters, one is interpreting what's going on, the other one can just simply point to where the voice is coming from. So I'm able to track where the comments are coming from and who's making it. And that increases, you know, the enjoyment of the environment. So think about all the different students that are in your classrooms. What do they need? Think about your facial cues. Students with cultural differences. Students with linguistic differences. Delays. Students with hearing loss, such as myself. Our visual equity is important to the understanding, and it's a small tweak that can be made, even just moving one seat really affected me in the long run. And there are still issues with the approach, uh, such as my professional career working at Amazon. I have to be proactive and I have to be vocal about the small tweaks that I need. Now in my work environment, um, you know, I make sure that I make a lot of noise about what I'm needing. I'm very uh, proactive with that. Now take for instance my office. If you were to walk in, you would notice that when you first walk into my office, I'm just kind of laid out. As soon as you come in, I'm able to have my desk facing the door. That way I'm able to see who comes in. My back is against the wall. That way I'm able to peer out. If someone walks into the office, starts talking, I'm able to look up from my work and really have a different experience in the space. I set reminders of my schedule and in my calendar for meetings as well um, for whoever invited me to that meeting so that they will have a list about, uh, you know, reminders, just please don't talk over each other. Um, when I sign, please look at me, don't look at the interpreter who's voicing. Just little reminders for the staff, you know, just little tweaks that can be made that really make a big difference and have a huge result. Now, the accommodations really are a big deal. You know, don't get me wrong, they do require a lot of work, a lot of trial by error, of course. But part of the things that make it easier is just the little steps, the little proactive things that we can do. Now, sometimes I do feel a little bit separate, you know, in my full-time job. Imagine how students feel. I feel that acquiring my accommodations are part of my part-time job. And now I'm going to uh, shift perspectives from being a student and talk about my experience as a professor. Now looking back at the grad school, I also taught ASL during this time period. I was at a small liberal arts college just down the road from the graduate school that I was attending. And that's where I eventually would meet my wife, but that's a whole nother story for another time. <laughs> I noticed one huge determining factor in the uh, communication, the interaction, was the culture of the classroom. Each class had their own personality. You know, having the students across, but you know, they all had their own personality when they walked into the room. It was just different from each period. It was an interesting observation. Some classes were warm and friendly. Some classes were very segmented. And 
I noticed that the classrooms really became a close unit. And typically those classes that had that unified feeling were the more fun classes. They were able or more willing to communicate with each other, learn with each other. And I've really, I've had the wide spectrum variation in students as well. I've had the you know, standard college student, I've had you know, the resistive uh, Chicagoan first individual to enter college from the family. Um, I've had different physical and cognitive disabilities in the classroom. I've had the, um, you know, the students that kind of just phoned it in when they came into the classroom as well. I've had the full spectrum. Now, what I noticed is when I made myself more human and opened myself up, it had a impressive result. Um, it was a more humanistic approach, and the students typically would immediately open up and allow themselves to be vulnerable in that space when they saw that I was being more vulnerable in front of them as well. I was able to establish that rapport with the students that made it a more, um, you know, open environment. If I was tough, if I was, you know, that strict teacher, then it would close myself off and then my students would also be closed off in the environment. But opening myself up would allow them to make the mistakes that they needed to in that environment. And that is part of universal design, is how can I improve the classroom experience with a few tweaks? And that's what I wanted to share with you. It's just one mistake that I've made in the past that demonstrates this. I had one student in the past, uh, and she was in her 70s. She was just entering college, and she wanted to go through the four-year interpreting program. Um, and we'll call her Pam for this story. I had her in my ASL2 course, and that course really uh, was a fourth of the way through the four-year program, yeah, right, right about that benchmark. And her science skills just plateaued at ASL2. She didn't improve. She was passing. She had passing grades on the exams and the assignments, but uh, she really didn't advance her skills during that time. And I believe that the barrier for her were twofold. And really how the human brain learns would be one. As, as we age, that does impact our learning capabilities and also society's assumption of older people. Now, Pam signing wasn't progressing that much, but she finished all of her assignments or projects. She had passed grades, as I mentioned. But the issue was kind of passing the buck to the next teacher and then having the next teacher deal with Pam. Unfortunately, I think a lot of us have experienced this before. Pam's skills did improve, but she did progress to the next levels. She went through as a technicality. What can we do? We can't do anything. She was not prepared to be an ASL interpreter, and uh, she ultimately would drop out later. And looking back, I think what my mistake was is that I wasn't curious enough about her goals. I wasn't engaging with her, asking her why she wanted to be an interpreter. You know, I was just interested in the now, not what she was wanting to become. I was not explicit enough of the complicated career that interpreting is, the complexity of it. When you're interpreting in a kindergarten classroom, and then, immediately, you're going to a court assignment into an in-depth case. And interpreters have to be able to switch their hats and switch their roles. And that's the kind of job that she was trying to get into. And she was not prepared for that full spectrum. And there was something that I felt that Pam really wasn't interested in. If I was a little bit more curious, if 
found out what she was interested in, you know, say for example, uh, she wanted to become an interpreter at a art museum or at a church, that I think I could have tweaked my curriculum to be able to encourage her and help her be successful. But looking back, my mistake was that I just passed the buck to the next professor. So, how do you achieve the perfect educational setup? I want to encourage you all to look here. So you know the common saying, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it makes a whole life They'll think that their whole life that they're stupid. You know, some of these animals will be able to climb a tree and have success. The monkey easily is able to climb the tree. Um, next animal you know, might be able to, next maybe, but the fish definitely can't. And Pam, with her experience, shows me that the benchmark that you use, the criteria that you use to measure your students really can break the approach in the education process. And here we're learning that disability is a social construct. For the door example that I had shown you just recently, yeah, it, that demonstrates that idea perfectly. The doorknob is great for people that are able to twist it, but the door stays shut. It's not accessible to the full spectrum of mobility capabilities. Now I'd like to really encourage everyone here and propose that everyone here has a disability to some extent. Maybe cognitive, temporary, permanent, physical, emotional. You know, if you break an arm, that's one example. Pregnant. Maybe you wear glasses. Or even uh, genderism. In Pam's case, it was her biological age, that was it. We are all disabled to a specific extent. In other words, my curriculum, it, it was the same the program through the ASL Foreign Language Department was set up for Pam to fail. It was doomed for her to fail. And then I just passed her on to the next instructor. And really, if I would have set my curriculum to be empathetic with Pam, that would have had a huge impact and set her up for success later on. So empathy, this is key to the universal accessibility education setup. It's our real job. Students who can commit to emotional safety in the classroom, get that promise. They can feel safe and can trust that the outcome of that, the outcome would be more positive. We need to find the empathy, the curiosity for each of our students. Change how the seating arrangements are laid out every day, just as an idea. Do an icebreaker. Ask what they're struggling with and what they need in order to improve. Many times asking what their goals are is a great idea and letting them know what your goals are as well. Sharing. Encouraging that openness and that vulnerability. That vulnerability comes with learning. The instructors can tell between a student who feels pointed out and they'll feel closed off and they'll just sink back into themselves. You know, and I know these things because I'm married to an instructor, to a teacher. Now my wife, she teaches first and second grade and she has a master's degree in neuroeducation. And she understands a lot about how the brain learns and understanding the concepts. And she also knows about people are you know, who just memorize and people who 
her learning. She's able to tell that difference. What do you think that difference is? And we're just, we're going to talk about the eyes for just a moment here. All of your other senses, all the other organs, your ears, must, must coordinate with another organ in order to get the information to your brain, but not the eyes. They are a direct connection through the optic nerve to your brain. So in theory, when you're looking at my eyes, you're actually looking at my brain. It's a little bit weird. <laughs> and just give a little bit of a summary of the anatomy. So if you look at the optic nerve, when they come into the brain, they're actually connected to the back portion. And that area is called the occipital lobe. And that is the visual processing center of the brain. And it's a really advanced uh, videographic card, if you think about it in that way. It's faster and more powerful than what we have. Uh, it says distance, um, depth, what is coming towards us, what is moving away from us. And a biologist, neurobiologist, had said that is giving us information through a functional MRI. If they use that, they're able to give us an image of the brain. It'll show us different pictures of what the brain looks like with specific areas in the brain that light up. And those areas that light up are the areas that are showing the most activity in the brain during uh, different uh, activities, thinking, hunger, sensations. And through that functional MRI, we are able to see different purposes and different functions. And they even use the functional MRI to observe how blind people, how their brains actually work. They encourage the blind people to uh, touch objects, feel different items, and guess what area of the brain lights up occipital lobe. Even though they can't see, it still lights up in the back. And that is how powerfully dependent we are on this area. Now the neurobiologists went ahead and wanted to do some more research. And they asked, well, while they're taking the MRI, the fMRI of the blind people, they asked them to give directions of how they arrived from point A to point B even though they're blind. They just want to test and see what happens. And the visual center will lit up right away. So even though they weren't able to see, their brain is seeing. And that's just how powerful the visual system is. I really found that that is an incredibly interesting fact about the human anatomy, the human body that even though they're not able to see, they're still able to use the visual center through touch and feel. So here are some examples of the fMRIs just to show you the different brain activity. Now back to my wife, she's not only a teacher for children, but she also studies how children learn and different avenues in which they learn, how they learn differently on an individual basis. Yesterday, before I uh, flew out here, I was really struggling with uh, lip reading and pronouncing this word. So she uh, showed me visibly how I'd be able to pronounce this. It was a visual example of the pronunciation. You know, English is not my first language, and that really helped me to visualize how to say this one simple word. It's just a simple example. Now, in her classroom, she really analyzes how students learn, and she does this by asking the students to draw a picture. And she asks them just to draw what they see in their brain. 
Now, this quarter, she has uh, been teaching her first and second grade students about airplanes, how they work, teaching the concept of flight with the yaw and pitch. And that, you know, concept is pretty abstract for first and second graders, but she uses visual designs to teach these to the children. And after her quarter, what she will have the students do is they're going to build their own airplanes, their own design, and then she'll have them give a small presentation about how the airplane works. And if they're able to articulate, you know, my airplane kind of is like this, with this kind of wing, through the yaw, then she's able to identify that they understood and comprehended the concept, and they're not just mimicking and regurgitating what she had taught them. Now, having a visual reference serves as a medium between students and teachers. And that's just another tool that we're able to use. And when she finds that someone is struggling in the classroom, and she's trying to get the students to complete a complicated task, she draws it out rather than just verbalizing it to them. And it doesn't leave anyone out in the class. She uses what she calls thought bubbles. So in this drawing, you're able to take a look. She tried to teach the concept of community to first and second graders. Really, their brains are just trying to process what that word community means. It's a very abstract term. So we're trying to see what it physically looks like through drawing using these thought bubbles. And that's just one example of using visual medium. Now, this kind of approach works for all ages, including me. For example, if she drew out how to pronounce something, I'm able to understand it better. The more visual information you provide in your classrooms for your students, the more you'll be reaching out to your students. Visual information can even include subtle things like facial expressions, where you stand in the classroom, or even how you arrange the seating. So what does that look like in a higher education setting? The main idea at work here is universal accessibility in the classroom is more empathy. So you're able to understand the process of just making simple tweaks that provide more access in the classroom and make the success easier to achieve with our students becoming willing to match their needs with just these small changes. And really, it makes the environment better for everyone. And remember to become curious about your students. Universal design is something that provides equal access or equity for everyone. And that's true in many cases. If we are discussing physical things, like the sliding doors, for example, but in the higher education setting, it's a little bit different. Students are organic beings. Often they evolve over time. They have varying needs from day to day. One day they'll need something, the next day they'll need something else. There's just not one solution for everyone. However, the goal for accessibility for each student is to be able to move through our educational training and get a continuum of, of accessibility throughout the program. And these visual references may be something that you haven't seen before. It just helps to visualize the difference between equality and equity. Here's an example. Now in this case, we have three people who want to watch a baseball game. All have equal size crate to be able to stand on to look over the fence. All have equal access, but one can't see the game. The person in the middle here can barely see over the fence. The taller one is fine. They're able to see. So that is the idea of equal accessibility. But if we look at equity of accessibility, we are matching the need to the person. 
so that everyone is able to see the game. And I want to push this thinking just a little bit further. What if you took down the fence and replaced it with a uh, chain link? Now everyone can see, and that's the, that's the idea that I want you to take in your approach to your classrooms. Now the fence is still serving its purpose. Everyone wins. And this is the idea for our goal in education, is that empathy, that curiosity, that simple tweak that will get us closer to universal design. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Sean, would you like to begin? So uh, Michael has uh, agreed to take questions from the crowd for the next uh, 20 or so minutes. Um, so uh, Dave and I are going to run the mic around. If you could just make sure to speak clearly so that interpreters can uh, render your speech for Michael, and we'll be uh, taking questions. Anybody would like to contribute? Yeah, back. Of course, the front's first one. Well, can I be loud? No. Um, why don't we do it just So I was wondering about the two interpreters. Is it a different language, or is it just about having the two interpreters for accessibility? Now you're speaking about the situation that's occurring now. Yes. Great. That is a great question. I'm happy that you asked. Now these two interpreters uh, really have two teams right now. Uh, the one team who is sitting here directly in front of me looking at me are the interpreters that are interpreting what I'm saying to the audience and what you are saying to me. They are a support system. Uh, they are cognitively heavy tasks right now. There's a delay. We have to use the concept, hear it, and then they're interpreting it. Now, these other two over here are interpreting for some clients that may be in the audience who have different needs. They don't need to look at me or they prefer to look at the interpreter sign a little bit more in an English fashion. Um, so if we back up to what I'm thinking here, so uh, deaf access really has a large spectrum of deafness. Um, I think that there are six um, in-house that work with me because the, I'm a very heavily ASL user. Now there is a, another interpreter who is a more English user. So they're able to speak for themselves, they're able to use another interpreter, so that's a really great question. Does that make sense? Perhaps along the same lines, perhaps not. Um, several years ago, in one of my classrooms, I had a, a student whose Spanish was their first language, English was their second. And after the first class, and this was when I was very new to teaching, she asked me if I could slow down a bit, and I do have a tendency to rush through. And she explained to me that she has to translate as she's taking notes. For example, she's translating my English into her Spanish as she's taking notes. And I was wondering, I know you go through this process with our interpreters, if you have any suggestions how we could, um, I guess, remind ourselves to have empathy for people who are in a similar situation. Yes, that's a good question. I'm curious what course you teach. That particular course was an uh, interpersonal communication class. <laughs> Where we talk about verbals, we talk about nonverbals, and then we also talk about, you know, creating messages. We talk about trying to share meaning, etc. Wow. Uh, that is a tricky one. I think when the student told you and asked if you 
would slow down. I think that that was a good one, but I'm curious about the different uh, instructor materials that you would have in the class. You had just mentioned um, the verbal part or the nonverbal part of the curriculum. What does that look like? Good question. Just, I mean, how, there, how there's a that? lot. There's a lot to it because. In our classroom, since we're an open enrollment institution, you know, you talked about each class having a personality, which it does, but we also have such a variety of learning abilities from students who may not take notes because they're not sure what's important um, to those who, you know, just kind of sail through because they've prepared classes. Um, I know in my attempt, I probably overdo things because I try to post notes, PowerPoints, those kinds of things on our Blackboard, even if it's a face-to-face -face class, um, and then provide them as we go through. So it's kind of like a material dump. But also in class, we're discussing things, we're showing things, we're doing examples, we're doing group work, we may do role play. It's, it's a variety of things. And you're trying to figure out, okay, what is working with whom? Yes, that's interesting. It's an interesting situation that I haven't thought of before. It sounds fascinating to be in that kind of situation trying to figure out the best solution. I'm curious, I'm trying to envision if that student, you had said that Spanish was their first language. Um, so I'm wondering if the uh, topic of the class could be designed in such a way where they'd be able to take the lead in one of your uh, curriculum plans where she'd be able to, um, you know, kind of advise the students of how to uh, better take an approach or, um, you know, just kind of take control of the curriculum for a moment. I'm just wondering if that's something that could have been done or if you've done that before. After she told me, once I realized that this was a situation with her, certainly then I was aware of it, and I took it into account. And as I would propose certain activities that we might do in class, because I often change my mind at the spur of the moment, I, I would often sometimes just kind of say, mm -hmm. I might check with them to see if this is going to be successful that, or how that, I might tweak that's it. A, simple change that really can have a long-term effect. I bet the student really appreciated you doing that. Uh, felt more involved in that class and not so far removed. Yeah. Next. How can we encourage students to advocate for themselves? Many of them are so shy or they don't. They don't want to be vulnerable to the teacher even. You know, that's a very good question. I think uh, you talk about vulnerability with students. You don't know, you know, anything about their needs. You know, you're vulnerable yourself in that situation as well. Help me. Tell the student what do you need. Help me help you. I think that opening up as a teacher, showing that vulnerability in our position, will hopefully lead to empowering the student to say, "Okay, yeah, I'll take control of that uh, that situation." From what I've seen thus far, that really helps a lot. Um, I've had some students who really struggled with sign um, because they had some mobility issues. So I, I reached out to them, you know, help me, give me some ideas. I have no idea what I can do. Let's work together. That's just one thing that you can do. Um, I have a question about the, how you use the term vulnerability and making ourselves vulnerable to students. Where's the line in terms of boundaries and ethics and self-disclosure in that um, exchange that you're referring to? Right, there's a lot of ethics in the classroom. I see what you're saying. I think that my meaning in terms of this word vulnerable is, for example, uh, someone, I think the first question uh, a person said, uh, can you tell me why we have 
four interpreters, that showed me that she's willing to be vulnerable and say, hi, I don't know why we have four interpreters here. Teach me. So that is what I mean by vulnerability. You know, you just kind of have to, I tip my hat off to you for asking that question because it really makes me feel that that person wants to learn. And that is what we need to have in a lot of our classroom settings. Looking back, you know, at my favorite instructor, they were just incredibly curious about what their students' interests were. And I think that's where the line is. Hello. So, in regards to the question about why we have the two teams of interpreters here, um, and the reason why is I asked uh, the interpreter at HR, I was like, oh, I wanted to set up um, having something available, and they said, uh, you know, because can you imagine that, yeah, so like you said earlier, we have a different, you know, language needs. You know, some for, like, the interpreters are closer, some can't seem too far, so my question was, you know, if someone's talking on the stage, and we had someone sitting, I can see both the interpreter, but if the person on the stage decided to walk around, or if the interpreter was standing over here and we have people looking both ways, like the visual uh, dichotomy gets stretched and skewed if he's going across the stage while the interpreter is in one place. So it's better to have the two teams so now that it's easy for the presenter to, ask, uh, to answer questions rather than during this Q&A setting, having the interpreter go back and forth with the audience and the presenter being able to you know, address the answers on the stage. So if someone's talking back there, you know, I have to then have them turn around and look back there and turn around. Like, it's just another reason why we have the two teams here for the accessibility. So I do thank all of you. And you know, most people would say, you know, oh no, it's expensive to pay for the two teams. You know, just two interpreters is enough. You don't need four. But again, you know, if you don't know, ask. And sometimes uh, people will think or assume things. Oh, you've got an interpreter established for you. Great, you're all set but that same interpreter doesn't work for everyone. So, you know, always being open, and then, you know, and just understand that that fact is maybe you don't know everything, because, you know, there is that plus one, the, uh, yeah, that UDL plus one, you know, that doesn't work for everyone. So maybe that plus one becomes an obstacle or a barrier for other students, so. Thank you. That is a great, point on expanding on that idea of why we have the two teams of interpreters. Um, you know, it, we had a little bit of a vague explanation as to why there was prior to my presentation, but, you know, she obviously has gone through this before and she knows, you know, what the experience is and is able to advocate for herself. You know, I need this, this, and this. Uh, and she's right. People who have the need for accommodations know how to find them. They know what is best for them. My one thought that I would throw out there is probably, uh, I left out of my presentations, to encourage you all to question the system that's already established for people here who have special needs. Um, you know, you probably have the um, policies with HR or whatever office is responsible for pulling in interpreters or, uh, for instance, uh, foreign language students. So you probably already have those processes established, but always challenge, always question that. Is that really what the student needs? And then ask the student. Tell the student, hey, I don't know what you need. Teach me, tell me. And I think that is the key. So I'm, I'm wondering if it ever gets annoying to have to answer questions all the time. I often, I'm very inquisitive. I wanna learn these kinds of things, but Maybe not you, I get the feeling that you don't, you like answering questions, but I wonder if other people in deaf culture don't want to educate people all the time. They just want us to, to know. Yes, uh, some people wish that you all already knew, but that's just not possible. You know, sometimes people really don't have patience. I used to be like that. I used to be very, um, how do I put it, um, yeah, uh, angry. I used to be an angry deaf person. I am deaf, damn it. You should know better. You owe me something. Um, and, and that was, you know, 
kind of a, a young perspective, but now as I've gotten older, you know, people are asking questions that I now know that you're trying to understand. I really took my hat off those people and try to provide the answers that I can. Um, those other deaf people, um, you know, I don't know what to tell you as far as that, you know, don't let that close you off. You know, don't let that stop you from trying. Please keep trying. You will find someone who is not so angry and closed off. Just keep trying, and you will find someone. Thank you, Michael. I'm enjoying your talk. I have uh, two related questions for you. Do you ever consider your deafness to be a gift? And what have you brought to the table for Amazon that's informed the sensory community? Okay, so the first question, let me think. Um. Now, in my upbringing in a deaf family, I never felt any different than anyone else. You know, that's just what it was. Um, I think outside of my family or outside of the deaf education setting, I felt, um, oh, oh, I'm different than everyone else now. And it was a little bit of a gift um, and a challenge. I think in work, my issue with deafness is, you know, it is my strongest and weakest uh, benefit or, you know, factor. Um, if we're looking at visual media and commercials, I'm able to, you know, create a visual story very easily and have that already set in my mind. But as a deaf employee, in a meeting, I feel a little bit overlooked, a little bit, um, you know, less than my peers. Um, so in one way, it's a great benefit. In one way, it's a little bit of a, a disadvantage. Now, what am I doing at Amazon or what has Amazon done for me? Um, in the beginning, when I was working, they gave me an interpreter that I was able to, you know, uh, it was like a third party a interpreting agency. So one meeting they would show up, I would just let the agency know um, and I had full access to them and they would build the company directly. Um, and then that went on for a few years. My meetings always were moved, uh, you know, just immediately and then the interpreter would show up and, uh, you know, I had a lot of variation with interpreters, so there was no consistency. It was a lot of extra work, so I had to work as art director and also uh, acquiring my interpreters for the meetings. So I told them that didn't work and changed to hiring an in-house interpreter staff, meaning that the interpreters can look at my calendar and then things started to proceed and improve, get better, and the office had a little bit of a strict security clearance for products, you know, because we're, you know, we have to be tight with our new products and devices. Um, they can't come in directly, so I had to keep going downstairs, grabbing them, laying them into the building, you know, if they had to go to the bathroom, I had to let them in if they need to leave for whatever reason. So now having a staff interpreter, they have their own badge, um, and all the other credentials that they need. So it's improving the situation. And, um, you know, they've been listening to me. So right now, I have two full-time staff interpreters, um, and they have their own desk next to mine. And while I'm working, if someone comes up and they need to speak to me, or people are making jokes, I'm able to look at my interpreter, or they're able to let me know that something's going on if they're talking about their um, or anything, I'd be able to stay in the loop and you know be in on that conversation throughout the day. And then also ask that additional access during meetings because they're there full time. So they already know the acronyms that we're using, the office uh, jokes and jargon. So they're just able to really facilitate that communication in a more efficient way. I'll, I'll get back to you. What is something that you wish people that were learning to be interpreters knew before they went into the field? Specifically the interpreter. Mm -hmm. hmm. Ooh, some, uh, ooh, that is a good question. I think one big misconcept or misconception with people who are looking at sign is, ooh, I can learn that. 
uh, maybe taking a few months to have an understanding, but no, sign is a foreign language. I have taught some students through a four-year program, and they're just not ready. They can't interpret. So that, um, I, I think that that's typically the first semester when we're, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back. The first semester student who just comes right into the program and it's their first time, typically I warn them, you know, let's be real, this is not going to be easy. This is, this is tough. You know, you might go through a four-year program and you're just not ready to interpret. I just, I come around and say that to them. You know, I don't mean to disencourage them, but just to be more real, some students, one year of study is all they get it. You know, they're just, they're there, and some students just can't because there's just that variety of people, that difference in the uh, cognitive processing. Some are able to pick up new tasks faster, and some just can't. Good morning. So I wanted to ask if we could dig a little bit deeper. Um, what I heard you say a lot was empathy, vulnerability, and a little bit of asking questions. And so, I mean, that makes sense, right? But I think that there's some, some paralysis around that, um, myself included. Well, how do I ask that question? Or what if I offend the individual because I don't know Right, and so I had an experience with a student here who um, is blind, and there was a, a fire drill on campus, uh, a very memorable experience for this student. There was a lot of anxiety, and so I was just trying to kind of disarm the student from that anxiety, and I was curious, and we were just chatting, and I said, can I ask you a question about your blindness? And she said yes, and um, I said, can you, can you help me understand what you see? Because I knew when you were talking earlier, um, I know that, that, that she has an experience when she's touching something, right? When people pass by her, does she see shadow? Um, and there was this moment where she paused after I asked the question and she smiled. And there was that connection there. And it was a pretty powerful one, and it took, it was, you know, one second. <laughs> and so I guess for the group and for myself, you know, how can we dig a little bit deeper? And do you have any, I guess, basic tips or approaches on how to ask that question? Uh, I think there is some paralysis there. Well, uh, that's a great question. Maybe not a good comparison or analogy, but um, have you learned to ride a bike, right? Everyone has. You fall off many times during that process, you know, but that didn't stop you from continuing to go and riding. Uh, I think with the mentality of feeling vulnerable and asking students to teach you what they need, sometimes the students will be a little resistant. You're gonna fall off the bike. You know, but you can't let that prevent you from trying. If the student is resistive, then try to find another area to be comfortable. You know, if they're resistant to my question, is it because I asked in a specific environment? Or is it because you are doing something else? You know, they weren't mentally prepared. Um, if they're resistive, there's obviously another layer of something that you need to learn. You need to peel back those layers because it's not just one layer. Someone asked me, you know, why do we have interpreters? And that's a pretty easy layer to peel back and explain. But, um, you know, with the more angry deaf, there are going to be additional layers that you have to peel back and just work through until you get down to that core issue. And I don't know if that makes sense, but that is something that still kind of plagues my mind as well. Great question. If we have one more, yeah. Okay. And this might be more for Melissa even. Sorry, Melissa. <laughs> How do we do this, being vulnerable, asking students what they need without violating FERPA laws? Well. <laughs> 
I think I saw someone raise a hand in the back. Yeah. Do we have one more question in the back? Do you find? Oh, Dave should ask it to me. I'm sorry, I missed your question. Would you please repeat your question? I believe I did not answer it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe the question got a little bit lost. Um, yeah, yeah, your question. Could you repeat it? How do we, how do we act, talk to the students about the vulnerable, about their... Thank you. <laughs> how do we talk to the students about their, I guess, their disability and asking them what they need without violating the FERPA laws. Am I making sense? Okay. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so I am not familiar with the laws, obviously, um, but I think that it's more of not asking a student what kind of disability they have, but more of how can I tweak myself or my approach to match your needs as an instructor, if that makes sense. You know, it's more about me as a teacher. Hi, I noticed that you're struggling in my classroom. How can I make it better for you? You know, just empowering them for what they need. You know, making I statements. You know, if I, you know, noticed that you were a little lost in the fire drill, how can I make this experience better for you next time? Put it on That's yourself. it. Put it on it's more about me as the teacher. But that, that's a good point. Um, I have a question about the gentleman whose voice we're hearing, and I'm wondering what that's like, because he is, he is, yes, um, he's, he's so good at <laughs> inflections and, and um, you know, translating to us really the spirit, not just the letter, but the spirit of what, what you're saying. And I'm curious about how you learned to do that. Great, I'm happy that you asked. Um, now, in most settings, the interpreters are neutral. They're just communication mediators. But in this setting, in this case, I know that you're curious about um, the power for the code of ethics that the interpreters can't, but I'm okay with uh, you, Mason, standing up and explaining just a little bit uh, about that, if, if you feel comfortable doing that. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so, Part of the training that we have is to focus on the code or the communication and mediation, but part of that with uh, spoken languages is that inflection. So in American Sign Language, we have the non-spoken uh, markers. So your voice, instead of having inflection, uh, you will see that we have raised eyebrows and everything. So really, it's just about that equality of access. The way that I learned that is I've been in the deaf community for 28 years now since I've been learning the language um, and it's just being that human and not robotic side of interpreting because it's so easy for interpreters to fall into just following the letter of what's being said or what's being signed in this case um, but I want Michael to come across as he wants to so it's about following uh, the spirit and not just the letter Thank you. Great, thank you, so. Thank you, Mason. And in the interest of time, we're actually at 1025 right now. Um, so we are blessed enough to have Michael stay with us for the whole day. So if you have more questions, I'm sure he'd be willing to hang out and, and continue to chat with you. Um, but if we could just have one more round of applause for Michael. <laughs>